not ready. <laughs> well, uh, welcome everybody on this um, afternoon here. Uh, I'm going to introduce the um, three uh, humorists uh, to my right here. Uh, to my immediate right is uh, Roy Blunt. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets the first laugh of the uh, afternoon on that. He's the uh, author of a number of books. One tells a soup, or I'm just a bug on the windshield of life. Uh, what men don't tell women. Um, it grows on you, which is a volume about a hair. Uh, the first book of his that I read was um, uh, Three Bricks Shy of a Load, which was a marvelous book about the uh, Pittsburgh um, uh, Steelers. Uh, he has written one of the shortest poems ever, a poem exactly, which is a song against broccoli, which goes, the neighborhood stores are all out of broccoli locally. <laughs> a number of other books, all with marvelous titles. Now, Where Were We? Uh, First Hubby, Camels Are Easy, Comedy Is Hard, and perhaps we should uh, get to talk about that uh, afterwards. Camels are easy, uh, comedy is uh, hard. Uh, he summed up his life once by saying, raised in South by Southern parents, couldn't play third base well enough, so became college journalist, ridiculed cultural enemies, boosted integration, decided to write, teach, went to Harvard Graduate School, didn't like it, <coughs> went back to journalism, liked it, got a column, ridiculed cultural enemies, wrote limericks, boosted integration, wanted to write for magazines, took writing job at Sports Illustrated, have seen country, met all kinds of people, heard all kinds of talk, like it, ready now to write a novel that sums it all up. <laughs> <coughs> Roy Blunt. <laughs> Fran Leibowitz is next to Roy, the author of two uh, best-selling books, Metropolitan Life is one and Social Studies is the other. Uh, Edmund White, a marvelous critic, wrote of her in the Washington Post book world that she is the f not only the funniest woman in America, she is also the guardi guardian of the proprieties. Like all satirists, she is a moralist, and like most moralists, she's a conservative. She is for the eternal varieties of sleep, civilized civilization, conversation, and cigarette smoking. <laughs> and the list of what she is against, uh, I must say, is somewhat longer. <laughs> um, a book I've not read, but which is described here, which sounds wonderful, a children's story, which is called Mr. Chaz and Liza Sue Meet the Pandas, uh, illustrated by Michael Graves, and it involves two children who unexpectedly discover two pandas hiding in their New York City apartment building. Pandas named Pandemonium and don't pander to public taste. <laughs> and they express anxiety about being discovered and they disguise themselves as dogs, something we truly must read. Um, she has been working on a novel for a long, long time, uh, something that everybody in America hopes to see one day. Uh, she says of herself, I've never met anyone who even comes close to me in laziness. I would have made a perfect heiress. I enjoy lounging and reading, and the other problem I have is fear of writing. The act of writing puts you in confrontation with yourself, which is why I think writers assiduously avoid writing. But we would hope that that novel will appear one day. What a thing it would be to read. And down at the end is Calvin Trillin, famous for just about everything. He's appeared, of course, on The Tonight Show, Late Night with David Letterman. He comes in and says wise things about the culture. Uh, born and raised in Kansas City, uh, wrote a wonderful family memoir called Messages from My Father. He's done a whole collection of, uh, collections of his essays, Uncivil Liberties, uh, With All Disrespect, uh, Enough's Enough, these are all titles, Too Soon to Tell, and If You Can't Say Something Nice, and he's the author of a wonderful uh, book called The Tummy Trilogy, which is about his adventures in various um, uh, restaurants. Um, uh, my name is uh, George Plimpton. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, classified uh, as a humorist, but more of a lunatic, um, <laughs> uh, being a uh, participatory uh, journalist. But I have just written a book, which is supposed to be funny, and since I do have the microphone, I will read just one letter. Uh, these, uh, the, the book is called Pet Peeves, and the book is a series of letters which are designed uh, to drive a veterinarian uh, nuts. And the veterinarian has left his office, and these letters are found crumpled on the floor. And this book, uh, illustrated by Ed Corrin, 
is a collection of these weird, strange letters, and here's just one of them. Dear Dr. Rauf, his name is Dr. Rauf, I have purchased an attack dog who has been trained to attack at the command Wisconsin. Since we live in Wisconsin, <laughs> the word comes up quite often, especially during the football season. Someone will say, next weekend we're going to the Wisconsin-Purdue game, and the dog goes into a frenzy and attacks. Do you know of any way we can deactivate Wisconsin from this dog's neural code, or should we move to Alabama? <laughs> so there we are. There's your, um, there's your panel to talk about um, humor. Uh, I thought perhaps we should take some sort of major statement that somebody has said about humor and um, talk about that for a while. Let's see what a good one would be. Um, Aristotle said that melancholy men, of all others, are most witty. Would you say, uh, panel, that being melancholy is a help in being funny? Or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That is to say, all funny men are... Now, what is the reverse of that? Well, I mean, that being funny helps you be melancholy, I guess. I, mean, I, I think people... I think that most funny writers, you never see a funny writer in a photograph in which he or she, a photograph in which he or she is smiling, I don't think. I think that comedy writers tend not to have great smiles, great natural smiles. If you get them talking, they'll, might, you know. But I think in many ways that being a funny writer is a compensation for a kind of not a great smile. You know, you have to prove to people that you don't feel as bad as you look. So you say something funny. <laughs> is one of my many theories, but that's part of it. Brian, do you help hold that uh, position at all? Uh, yeah, the question is, do I find all melancholy men to be, is that the question? Yes, that melancholy is part of being, um, that a melancholic mean, a melancholic character is, in compensation perhaps, uh, one is funny. I need no compensation for being melancholy. <laughs> I find despair enough. <laughs> I think it's sufficient on its own. You say what? I think it's sufficient on its own, melancholy. I think the reason that you don't see funny people smiling is it's hard to look pleasant for that long. I think that's the case with me, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a morose turn of mind, yes, that would yeah. make you funny. Morose. That's yes, I would say morose. It's a morose Not melancholy. Melancholy is kind of, has a kind of touching aspect to it. I would say morose. That's more serious. Do you stand for morose, but right down there at the end, or melancholy? Um... <laughs> I guess I'm an exception to the rule. I'm a cheerful person and a pleasure to be around. <laughs> uh, uh, but I rarely smile. <laughs> Here's the uh, uh, statement from the Koran. He deserves paradise who makes his companions laugh. Absolutely. <laughs> I go for that. So paradise is for you. Well, but Mark Twain said there is no laughter in heaven because there's no reason to laugh. And nothing. He also didn't think heaven sounded like much fun because every time everything that people talk about doing in heaven, like uh, singing hymns and playing the harp and uh, going to lengthy church services, were exactly the things that people didn't want to do on earth. <laughs> Well, Moliere says, "'Tis a strange undertaking to make the gentry laugh." Where are you getting all these quotes? <laughs> <laughs> you look under I made H in one of those quote books. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna read uh, stuff we wrote. I mean, what's uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is, who are all these foreigners you keep <laughs> quoting? <laughs> They're going to run out and buy Voltaire's books. Why not come uh, well, I'm scaring you a bit with these things. I can tell you're desperate over there. What was the last one, George? <laughs> <laughs> the last one was Moliere. It is a strange undertaking to make the gentry laugh, which sounds more like Mark Twain's idea, doesn't it? Well, the problem is not strange, but uh, not very remunerative. I mean, the, <laughs> uh, the um, I know when people say to me, aren't you, aren't you ashamed of making a living by, by making snide, underhanded, unfair remarks about respectable public servants. My only defense is it's not much of a living. 
<laughs> uh, well, let's take another tag. How difficult is it to make people laugh? <laughs> the gentry or people? You, you just <laughs> made. Because <laughs> it's easy to make the gentry laugh. We'll leave out the gentry. Fine. <laughs> what, is the, what is the secret? What is it? Here we have three um, people who write. And presumably, to, it's, it's curious because it's very easy to make people laugh, presumably, in conversation. So in theory, one w a, a person that can make somebody laugh at a cocktail party should be able to sit down and make um, and put those that laughter onto paper. But that's not so, is it? No, because you can't count on them, be them being drunk like you can at a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> when so they read it, they could be sober. Ah, but what, well, sober <laughs> or drunk. But what is the secret? Or there must be a secret, mustn't there? Because everybody laughs. Um, with uh, rare exceptions, maybe four or five times a day. But the secret of your success is that uh, you can put that down on paper and make people laugh, which uh, the normal person cannot. So what is it? Is it, is it a cast of uh, the way you look at life? I was taught to diagram sentences in, uh, in high school, and I think that's a great, you know, I recommend that to anybody who wants to, <laughs> you know, put something down on paper that makes anybody do anything. You know, you gotta be able to write well and be, be precise. And I, don't, and I don't think anybody knows how to be funny, but everybody, you can, I mean, you can't tell people how to be funny, but you can tell people a little bit how to, you know, write decent sentences. But it's much easier to sit down and write a sentence which describes how to build a, um, um, a, a, um, a house or a, um, a playhouse or whatever. But it is very difficult to sit down and write something. That's what I'm trying to find out mm. from you turn of mind. Yeah, it's a turn of mind. It's like being able to wiggle your ears, a minor facility that some people have and some people don't. Mm -hmm. and, um, I usually say a trick thumb. A, a trick thumb <laughs> or, or, or wiggle ears. That's Trick thumb's harder <laughs> than wiggling your ears. I take your word for it. Yeah. I can't do either one what of those. What is a trick things. thumb? Well, Roy d both has a trick thumb and can wiggle his <laughs> ears. So. <laughs> So, so if you all would like to see a demonstration of that, I, I think Roy would be able to do it right now. I don't go for cheap laughs. I don't do anything <laughs> that you can't do in writing. So, <laughs> but well, I think a lot of it do, there are you know sort of autobiographical elements to things. My mother was. Uh, uh, I w wrote a book in which I cited this as an example of why people are always asking you why you why you're funny. And it's just an all, when you go out on the road promote your book, they say how'd you get to be so funny, and there's always a sort of uh, element of so-called funny. You know, how did you ever get to the point where some people seem to, your publicity release says you're funny. But uh, my, my mother was extremely self-dramatizing and was extremely tragic. My mother would say things like, you have ripped out my heart and jumped up and down on it on the kitchen floor. And uh, I figured in my generation, it was if my mother had gone on then to say, in your dirty shoes, you know, then it would have been funny. You know, it just had to be pushed a little further would have been funny, and so it's my, I can't uh, equal her in tragedy, but maybe I can just push it a little over the top, and uh, that's what I, I, I often feel that I am doing my mother tongue in cheek <laughs> when I'm being funny. But well, you also, also I think, I think that if you, um, if you get some uh, response, if you happen to be able to make people laugh and you get some response, I remember precisely the, the first time that I realized that it was a good thing. I was in Sunday school, and we came to the passage about uh, holding Jerusalem in your heart. And it said, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And I, just, and I was a shy little boy. And it was about sixth grade, I guess. And I stood up and said, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning and my tongue <laughs> cleave to the roof of my mouth. <laughs> And, and, and everybody laughed. I was kicked out of class. And, but but uh, I thought, hey, that's easy. Brian, was there a moment that you suddenly realized that, uh, or everybody else thought that you were? No, I went fr directly from being fresh to getting paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> there was no moment in my childhood where I was anything but punished for this. No transition at all? None. Zero. I was fresh. I got kicked out of high school, I went to New York, I was paid. <laughs> 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 it was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, uh, that uh, Southerners have a sense that language itself is funny. 
uh, at least I always, I mean, it's just, you make noises with your tongue and your hard palate. And, uh, uh, Roy can do that too. <laughs> just after he does That's the trick right. thumb and the thing, he's he going to make a, the, hard the noise with the palate. He's fantastic at it. Right. Don't, don't let him just try to be shy. Go ahead and insist that he does it. I never, I could only do that till I was 13 years old and then I, then I started to form words and I became a humorist. <laughs> But, I, but I, I think people like to play, I think that people, you know, the language is funny, that we've got this bizarre, uh, I think the English language is like a George Price cartoon, you know, all these sort of weird things crammed in together, all these elements of, uh, of Choctaw and Yiddish and, uh, and uh, you know, every other language crammed in together into, uh, into little lines of type. And uh, there's something, with wonderful comic potential in the American English language. The great people say that, or Hemingway said that the modern modern American fiction, fiction modern American literature began with a novel by Mr. Uh, Mark Twain called uh, uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which is a comic novel. And, uh, that's where the, the American language first got harnessed into literature, was in that novel, a combination of formal and vernacular English. And I think that's a great uh, start for that the first great American novel is still probably the funniest American novel. Is there a connection between um, ethnicity and religion and race and, and humor? You talk about the southern... Other peoples. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does that mean? There's a connection for most people between other people's ethnicity and race. But it's not, and not, not, not of amusement among whatever the ethnic race it is, whatever the ethnic group it is. Doesn't one laugh You're at one... You're among one now, by the way. Yes. <laughs> You're among mine now, so watch what you say. <laughs> You know, well, I, th I think people have talked about the fact that immigrants often uh, uh, or tend to be writers. First generation Americans are often struck by the difference between their family's language and the national language or the official language and therefore become very conscious of language and, and enjoy the, or at least are troubled or something or entertained by the difference between the ways language is spoken at home and the way they hear it on the radio or something. And, that gives them a, a sense of that the language is not just cut and dried, but a but a thing that can be a malleable thing and a challenging and interesting and mm -hmm. comic thing. And I think a lot of, you know, I don't know, uh, a lot of Jewish uh, writers have been comic writers and uh, and have written. And you know, you have per Perlman and uh, a lot of people uh, uh, sort of uh, being confronted by this new language and uh, finding it. Uh, odd and not just taking it for granted. Also, part of that was that is that um, Yiddish is a very homely language and, and so it's funny often, just words are funny. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a, uh, a fully developed fancy language. And um, I think that ethnic humor is, is often shared within the ethnic group. I, I was on a um, a panel once on, on Jewish humor with uh, 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 several people, including a uh, screenwriter and a book writer for musicals <coughs> named uh, Peter Stone, who knows every Jewish joke. I don't mean he knows most of Jewish jokes. He knows all Jewish jokes. And um, so, he, so he can, t uh, so when, when he talks about it, you can see, for instance, um, some of the some of the things that and, and the same would be true with with Italian jokes or within within the Italian community. Not I don't mean jokes about two guys who speak broken English um, or gay jokes or anything like that. So he can tell one partner's joke uh, about misogyny, where where the partner comes home, the guy comes home unexpectedly from work, and he finds his wife in bed with his partner. And he says, Jake, I have to, but you? <laughs> um, uh, th this, is, this is a misogynist joke that, and, and, and but the people who are hearing it understand that there is that strain, whether they like to admit it or not, in the, in the culture. Um, or the uh, materialistic joke is also a partner joke, which is that a woman comes home unexpectedly um, finds her husband in bed with a popsy and screams and yells and I'm going to kill myself and everything and the popsy runs out and he finally calms her down and says, you know, you've been married for years and she, oh, all right, and they, they go out 
for dinner, and the guy's partner walks in with a popsy into the restaurant, and the woman looks to her husband and says, ours is nicer. <laughs> um, um, okay, so there are two partner jokes, right? Um, but, they're, but they're both based on something that an ethnic group in itself, in the same way that black people tell black jokes among themselves that probably wouldn't be appropriate for a white person to tell, particularly if there are no black people. And I always thought that the judge about whether you can tell an ethnic joke is, would you tell the joke if a person of that ethnic background was standing there? Uh, if you would, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but, th but often within the group, uh, these jokes might be told, um, w uh, which would sound really rather nasty um, outside the group. If one member of that group who's bigger than you, than you are is in the <laughs> That's right, that's right. A nasty looking member that's of right. that group. The, I, I know one Scandinavian American joke, which is they apparently they're a Lena and, what are they, Lena and Oli joke. And, right. and uh, Oli came home and Lena was sitting on the side of the bed naked. And he said, Lena, why don't you have any clothes on? And she said, well, I don't have anything to wear. And he said, what do you mean you don't have anything to wear? He opened up the bedroom closet. He said, here's your yellow dress, here's your blue dress, Here's your red dress. Here's Sven. Here's your white dress. <laughs> I can. I, this Are I, there I any Scandinavians <laughs> in the room? <laughs> I thought I was. <laughs> no. I was doing a story on the uh, on Augusta. This is not a joke, but uh, Jack Nicholas used to have this uh, caddy called Willie Peterson. And a number of years ago, uh, Willie Peterson uh, couldn't come down to the Masters Golf Tournament because he was in the hospital. And the reason he was in the hospital uh, was that he came home late that uh, one night and found his uh, wife in bed with, a, with another man, and his wife took out a pistol and shot him. <laughs> <laughs> For it was invasion of privacy. <laughs> Fair enough. He said, wait a minute. <laughs> That's the old switcheroo there. The switcheroo, right. Joe, yeah. I, well, there is also the old element. I mean, without getting too pathetic about everything, I once heard Minnie Pearl of the Grand Ole Opry talk about how she figured out she was going to be funny. She entered a beauty contest in high school, and she went out strutting along like the other contestants, and uh, people started laughing, and she, and it was a shock, but she went with it and started, you know, pretending to be, she was trying to be funny. And uh, that, uh, you know. I think there's an element of that that you, uh, if people are laughing at you, you try to take advantage of it and turn it around. And, uh. mm. Is there a, do you think as, uh, that humorists or people who can write um, comedy or write amusing lines, do you think they look at the world as they move through the day rather differently than the rest of us? I mean, you write these marvelous columns, Bud, for the nation, these little poems, um, and you have to produce one every week. Presumably right. there is some way that you look at the world differently than the rest of us who couldn't do that. I only look thing. at the world differently on Sunday night when I need to write it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I usually turn the shower to iambic pentameter and, and it works out usually by the time I get out of the shower. How does I the shower call. work, iambic pentameter? Well, you get those special nozzles and go <laughs> ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. I mean, my candidate was Ross Perot. I loved Ross Perot. He was the only really iambic candidate. Ba -bum, ba -bum. Um, Give us a couple. These guys are terrible because Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader. <laughs> uh, I just wrote a poem about Ralph Nader, but it doesn't use his name as a rhyme. It's basically that some people who ordinarily vote Democratic were looking for more, and what they found was somebody more sanctimonious than Albert Gore. <laughs> um, um, but. Um, <coughs> These guys, uh, Bush is a terrible problem. Uh, it only rhymes with tush. Uh, and, and, and I consider that disrespectful. And when, when uh, actually, um, I did write a poem about Bush uh, that didn't end with his name uh, when his, um, his transcript was um, leaked, from his Yale transcript, uh, which as you know was not uh, Distinguished, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> um, uh, and I think the fact that that got him into Harvard Business School 
uh, is another confirmation of which class of Americans the original affirmative action system uh, was set up to benefit. Um, but at, at any rate, uh, it didn't seem to make any difference, and I wrote a poem, Obliviously on he sails with marks not quite as good as quails. <laughs> um, the, uh, by the way, I get a flat rate for these poems, not, <laughs> not by the line. Uh, I, most poets are paid by the line, get $100, uh, no matter uh, how long the poem is, which is a sort of uh, incentive to write two-line poems. And I, <laughs> where I get $50 a line, and I, years ago when uh, Lloyd Benson was named Secretary of Treasury, I wrote a two-line poem called Lloyd Benson's Dealings with Special Interest Groups. Uh, which went, the man is known for pro quo quidness. In Texas, that's how folks do business. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, Clinton is a terrible rhyme. And, and the last time, actually, I wrote when Mrs. Clinton, remember at the beginning of the, the late unpleasantness uh, in the White House, um, Mrs. Clinton sort of took charge of the defense and went on the Today Show and everything. And uh, I couldn't do Clinton, so I had to use her, uh, I guess we don't say maiden name anymore, her, her uh, slave name. And <laughs> um, so I wrote a poem, uh, and so it's up to our Ms. Rodham to prove Bill's White House isn't Sodom. <laughs> uh, it's up to this adroit senora to show that it is just Gomorrah. Um, <laughs> And I would end with a, uh, this little soliloquy with a, uh, <coughs> with a poem I did uh, to show you the trouble with rhyming with Bush. I had to use uh, the elder Bush's uh, middle names uh, t when he left. Fortunately, he has many uh, middle names. Um, so when he left, I wrote a poem that was, uh, Farewell to you, George Herbert Walker, though never treasured as a talker, your predicates were often prone to wander nounless off alone. <laughs> um, you, you did your best in your own way, the way of Greenwich Country Day. So just relax and take your ease and never order Japanese. <laughs> um, what was the question that was an answer to? <laughs> No, I was asking how those things come to mind. You say on um, on Sunday night, sitting in your shower, which somehow wakes in iambic pentameters, and that was a very a good answer. Um, and thank, thank you. you for explanation. Then I went on a little bit after. I don't that. think anybody else wants to get in your shower, however. Mm. <laughs> Fran, what about you? The what about me? What? The act of <laughs> composition, the act of coming of um, of uh, producing pieces, columns. You have to do the same thing. You have to do it once, what, every two weeks? Every few years. <laughs> like clockwork. Like clockwork. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they just don't, they don't send it, so they don't come out of the, on the, on the, on the computer. Or they, they must be some thought. They must be I don't some have a computer, so they don't come out on the computer. Yeah. Um, I have a pen and a pad. And I have no idea where it comes from. If I did, more of it would come. <laughs> <laughs> I would then summon it. I don't know. Deadlines probably are a good thing because they make you write. Otherwise, I don't know who would write other than, say, Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> you know, I think other than what? Other than Joyce Carol Oates, I don't know who would write without a deadline. They do, it does force you to write. Yeah. <coughs> but I really don't know. I have no idea. I'm, I'm told that when Stephen King is asked where his ideas come from, he often says Utica, <laughs> which is a city in New York State that nobody's ever been to. <laughs> so it's a mystery, I think. So just easy as that. You, is there an audience you think of? Would you sit down? No. 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 <coughs> if, if I think it's funny, then I think it's funny. Yeah. I couldn't possibly, and that's how they write television. That's why it's not funny. Yeah. You, <laughs> you can't imagine what someone else would think yeah. is funny. Uh, you know, um, it's very individual. Mm -hmm. you know. do, you read, do you read the material once you've finished it to somebody? I read it as sure I it write it. Pardon me? I read it as I write it aloud to myself millions and millions of times. So by the end of it, I'm really sick of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mean, do I ask someone's opinion of it? No. Yeah. 
Do you read your material, Bud, to, to uh, anybody to um, make sure it's funny? Uh, I, uh, Alice reads it, my wife. And um, I've never shown anything to anybody except Alice before it was. Uh, and um, Is she brave enough to say she doesn't like it? Well, that's an excellent question because um, when, when a writer hands something to somebody to be read, even if he knows realistically that it's sort of a rough draft and needs a lot of work, what he really wants in his heart of hearts is for the person to say, perfect, don't change a word, <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, and when uh, there was an older writer at the New Yorker who said to me when, when he learned that I showed things to Alice, um, that is a, that's a terrible idea. I mean, that's a very bad, bad for the marriage because of the fact that it's a burden on her and, um, and you really want to, want to hear that it's perfect and, sh and she being honest is gonna tell you it isn't, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I think you're absolutely right, and if I could get along without it, I would. Uh, but I can't. Um, so I still do it, and he's divorced. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do think it's hard. I think it's terribly hard to read something that, that, um, that somebody else should read. But, but she's the only one I trust. Cause, and, and also, she, I just happen to be lucky. I mean, I, she works as an editor. She works as a college English teacher, she's got a very good eye. And if, I mean, I, if I, I suppose if, I, if my wife were a physicist or something, we weren't interested in, in that s mm -hmm. sort of thing, I wouldn't do it, but. I have a 900 number, I call. <laughs> <laughs> I used to call that number. <laughs> yeah. But they, now they, it's blocked by the police, I Roy. <laughs> I used to call the 900 number in the New York Times that gave you three hints to the crossword puzzle <laughs> for, <laughs> I, I figured it was about three facts for $1.65. I don't actually do crossword puzzles, but um, I had two daughters in college at the time, and the tuition I was paying, I figured three facts for $1.65, <laughs> which is sort of bargain I just couldn't pass up. So <laughs> I, uh, do the uh, targets of your uh, savagery or wit uh, ever come knocking at your door? Are you talking to me? I'm talking to you and Fran. I don't think uh, Roy writes things that would have people come knocking. Roy is a door. really sweet person, unlike Fran and me. I know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a door. I live out in the country. Where <laughs> um, no, um, I, I met one of them once at a small dinner party, and he and my wife got into a terrible shouting match, uh, but he never said a word about what I'd written about it. I actually wrote a column for Brill's content um, uh, a couple of months ago about going to a, d my, my sort of fantasy of going to a dinner party in New York, and I, I'm the first one to arrive, and the only other person there is Steve Forbes. <laughs> and, and I've probably said some mildly critical things about Steve Forbes. Um, dork Robot was one of them. <laughs> and, 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 um, and, and the hostess says, well, I have to tend to something in the kitchen. I'm sure that you and you two have a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. She leaves, and then, so, and then I suddenly realize that Steve Forbes actually doesn't have to smile all the time. Uh, usually, you always saw him smiling, um, and he turns kind of maniacal and reaches for the cutlery, whereupon about five or six other people I've said rude things about him, and Donald Trump is there, and and, and a lot of people. Um, but I, I actually don't see them, and they don't really, I don't think they'd lower themselves. Uh, they'd, they'd really be dumb to complain. I've, I've, never, I've never had anybody complain. I mean, a lot of times they're political figures and things, and, th and they, I think they would be, um, I, th I think, I, I met um, uh, Oscar de la Renta once, um, who I had, I had written a, a piece about uh, the salon at Oscar de la Renta's house, which was, uh, I suppose, critical. I mean, it was supposed to be funny. And it mentioned, among other things, that his name actually is Oscar Renta, and he added the de la. <laughs> um, um, and um, he was charming. He was absolutely so nice about it. It was obvious that he'd read it because it was, you know, his friends had read it. Um, 
I think, I think people, I don't think it's a problem. I tell you the opposite is the problem. If I actually knew people like that, I don't think I could write things like that about them. I mean, even if I didn't like them particularly, just the personal contact. So, so I'm happy not to live in Washington and, and sort of go to those dinner parties or wherever they all meet each other. I met George W. Bush Jr. right after I published a book in which his father, a novel in which his father was poisoned by Mar Marilyn Quayle. <laughs> and, uh, and someone read it to him? <laughs> he had heard, yeah, he had it read. <laughs> 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 and uh, he, was, he, he was with the Texas Rangers then, and there all these Texas Ranger guys there, Bobby Valentine then was the manager of Texas. And, and somebody told Bobby Valentine that I'd written the same. I think Bobby Valentine was going to hit me. I mean, he just felt that it was wrong. Uh, and he obviously hadn't read it. But George W. was, you know, you can imagine what he was like. He just sort of got up in my face and sort of acted like he was going to pop me with a towel off and was very jocular about it. Hmm. And that, I was more uncomfortable than he was. And uh, now I don't think I would, I, I feel, yeah, I think Bud's right that once you see these people as people, you don't want to hurt their, you don't want to. I now take it back. <laughs> I now, well, no, not that part. I don't take that back. But, but I once was at an ABA, uh, American Booksellers Association, which is obviously called something else now, but, but it was then they had their convention in California. And I was part of a uh, breakfast program with uh, Jimmy Carter when he was doing his book. And, and, I, and my book was a collection of columns um, that started in the Reagan uh, no, started in the Carter administration and then ended in the Reagan administration. And I actually told him, he said, well, I haven't read your book, but I understand it's very funny. And I said, well, Mr. President, I think maybe if you did want to read it, it might be a good idea to start at the back. <laughs> um, and about the time you think you should stop reading, it would be a good time uh, to stop reading. And, um, and then he made a remark in... Um, in his speech about something I had said about his, his daughter, which actually one of the few things that I, that I draw the line at, and I really don't insult people's children. Uh, it was something about whether, about how about charming she was or something like that, uh, which I hadn't said, but it was, it was rather ill-tempered. I mean, it was, it was meant to be in complaint. Um, and um, I, um, I do see, I was the MC of a, the Episcopal uh, Charities benefit last year, and the guy s the in charge of it said, "Oh, the the, the mayor, Mayor Giuliani, is uh, has been added to the speakers at the last minute. So I hope you have something to say to introduce him." And I said, "Well, um, the last thing I said about him in a column was that he may be the only uh, Italian American in the Greater New York area with no personal charm." Um, I said, how about that? I said, no, I don't think, then I said, oh, I'll try to think of something else. Uh, but most of these guys are used to all this stuff. I don't think they care much yeah, about it. I think it's less intrusive to make fun of somebody than to explain somebody at great solemn length in a book, you know, the making of, you know, all these books about why Al Gore is the way he is and what his inner life must be and how his relationship to his father. That's the kind of book that would piss me off if I were... You know, the object of one, I not agree. somebody making fun of them. I remember writing in a book about football about Paper Lion. I'd lost 32 yards in four plays as the quarterback for the Detroit Lions. And, and uh, we went out on the town in Detroit in relief. That I, sort of a, a, this was a success. I'd survived it. And uh, we got back. I got back to the room. I must 4 o'clock in the morning and um, after this night of revelry and celebration. And there was a knock on the door, and it was an offensive guard named Harley Sewell. And he lived uh, in a training camp with his wife, outside the training camp with his wife and, uh, and two children. And he felt that I was going to wake up wrong, uh, having lost the 32 yards, that I would hold my head in my hand in grief and so forth. And he wanted to uh, make me, as he put it, shouted through the door, to wake up right. And he got me out of bed and took me off. I remember putting my head out the window of the station wagon to try to uh, to wake up, and uh, he took me to his house, and there were pancakes and so forth, and uh, two children romping around, and an Irish setter and everything. It was it was a wonderful way, in a sense. He'd done this very kind thing, and uh, I wrote about this in uh, uh, Paper Lion, and he was absolutely outraged, 
uh, because it made him seem like a softy. And uh, that the offensive, that when he was playing offensive guard, that the big tackles opposite him, who had, re who had read the book, this was his idea, I don't think any of them would have read the darn thing. <laughs> uh, his idea was they'd all shout, aha, I took that guy to, uh, I gave him some pancakes, did you? I uh, softy, and they'd whack him. And uh, here I was trying to be terribly nice to this man, and, and the result was his uh, great rage, and got angry letters from him. He finally calmed down. He ran for public office in Texas and began to forget that, but it was a... Uh, That'll so calm you, you down. What? <laughs> <laughs> I oh, absolutely that. agree with Roy. I think that, I think the worst thing would be one of these psycho babble books where people tell about a politician or somebody why he does something and and, and all of this. Like these books uh, about uh, Hillary's Hillary's the way she is because her daddy didn't come to her graduation. Then it turns out he did come to her graduation. I mean, I, I'd be furious if somebody wrote anything like that about me. Uh, but just kind of making fun of you or making fun of your policies. It, mm. I mean, I think these guys, if they haven't gotten used to it, are sort of out of the game by now. Are there topics you should shy away from then? I'll let Fran handle that one. Fran, no. that's a question <laughs> for Fran. I never write about people, so I've never had this problem or lack of problem. Are there topics you mean that you should make fun of? Yeah, that you should steer clear of. I mean, would you, there's no, I nothing. I haven't come across any. Uh, well, what are some <laughs> of the more uh, extreme oh. that you've tackled? I, don't, I, don't, I haven't memorized all my work. I don't know. You know I, um, I think you're making a big mistake not memorizing your work. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what, I, I haven't often written about politics, first of all. So, um, no, I think anything's funny as long as it doesn't happen to you. That's the difference between comedy and tragedy. But doesn't almost <laughs> everything happen to everybody? No, things are funny if they happen to other people. If they happen to you, they're tragic. Such as? Such as almost anything unpleasant, for instance. The basis of all humor is making fun of something. You know, when people uh, often criticize, especially in LA, criticize um, a certain kind of humor for being negative. Um, that's negative, that's you know, against something. That's, I think, what funny things are. Mm. You know, that even a man slipping on a banana peel. So I think anything that happens to another person can be funny, no matter what it is. A friend of mine once was leaning on the back of a car when somebody else was in it, and uh, the person in the car activated the automatic aerial. It goes up like this. And he woke up just as the aerial was moving up. <laughs> <laughs> and he just had a few seconds to get up off of the aerial. <laughs> And uh, if, you know, if he hadn't had that split second to get off of the aerial, it wouldn't have been funny. He had to call up, you know, no, that would have been great driven. obituary. <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, describing what happened to that guy. Yeah, the, I, th I think it depends on the, I think that, that uh, uh, as far as offensiveness, that there's sort of a self-selection. If it's funny, it probably isn't offensive. And, uh, and, and the stuff that offends people usually isn't funny. Um, I mean, that is, um, I wrote a piece once on a guy named Joe Bob Briggs, who was actually the, the pen name of, a, of another guy who was a movie reviewer um, for, for the Dallas uh, Times-Herald. And uh, the, the other, the real guy wrote the, what the Nouveau Vogue, movies and reviews and everything and Joe Bob was this 19 year old drive-in movie guy and um, he he talked about um, how many breasts were seen in each movie I mean, and rated them that way and, and he was a really crude uh, guy and um, Joe Bob finally I mean he offended a lot of people I mean he I mean his his word for Mexican was Mexican you know that's the way uh, Joe Bob talked um, and a lot of gay humor and everything that was, uh, but, but he went along fine, or at least on the edge, until he wrote uh, a song that was a parody of that song, We Are the World, which was called We Are the Weird. And it was a bunch of uh, mutants and a lot of people from those drive-in movies and everything. Um, and the problem with it was it wasn't funny. So it, it just was just lying there waiting for analysis. But if it's funny, uh, there isn't any analysis. You just laugh, and 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 whether whether it's okay or not, I think sometimes it has to do with length of time. Like Lincoln jokes, 
are funny, but they're about an assassination. I mean, they can be funny, but it's been, it was a long time ago. Lincoln w would not have survived till now, even if he hadn't been assassinated. And and um, or, or like there's like there was a great line of Zero Mostel's about Romanian Jewish cooking, which is a sort of extremely heavy um, type of uh, cooking that used to be a number of restaurants in New York. There probably may be one or two left. Uh, where where they actually have um, liquid um, chicken fat schmaltz on the table in, in a pitcher to to improve on the chef's excesses if you want to, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of garlic in the food and uh, to wait you know the Hungarians are worried about I mean Romanians are worried about uh, um, the um, Dracula and those guys and then if you don't the werewolves and things. And and so you use a lot of garlic, and if you then you use a lot of schmaltz. So if he gets through the garlic, uh, you hit him with, with heartburn. This second defense, but uh, Zero Mostel loved this place called the Parkway. But his line about about Romanian Jewish food was, "It's killed more Jews than Hitler." Mm. <laughs> um, well, a that's German a couldn't make that joke. What? A German probably. A German would have a little trouble. Especially yeah, in an we'll accent. Any joke. <laughs> yeah, that's, Actually, <laughs> true. <laughs> that's true too. Um, but when you think of it, that's kind of a, and, and it's a Holocaust joke in a way. But it's funny, and it, and it's also, I mean, there's, um, I th I think if it's funny, you don't have to worry about it. And and if you made jokes about sick children or something, it wouldn't be funny. So yeah. so I mean, it would. Fun, I think the fun of being a funny writer is to go after, is to try to be funny about sore spots and there's no real point in being funny about something that everybody knows is funny but it's a sort of public service to uh, if there's some kind of thing that's been swelling and building up and, uh, and nobody wants to talk about it if you can be funny about it uh, it's uh, it's uh, you know at least it's a life's attention but if you miss you then your your career is over but so we're basically <laughs> we're basically boil lancers boil lancers, <laughs> that's right. as opposed to bingle though but I think that uh, you ought to be like a cat cats come into a room and they immediately find the person in the room that hates cats and goes and sits in their lap. <laughs> you have to look for those points. John Mortimer, uh, we went to a, uh, Bud and uh, Roy went to a conference in Italy and John Mortimer <coughs> kind of talking about humor talked about how the macabre is often gives you a wonderful sense if, if twisted the right way can be funny and he told us, he read this clipping from the Edinburgh Evening News which is supposed to be very serious in a way and here it is, it's 1978 on August 18th, and here was the column. While they were waiting at a bus stop in Clemerston, Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Thirsty were threatened by a Mr. Robert Clear. He demanded that I give him my wife's purse, said Mr. Thirsty, telling him that the purse was in her basket. I bent down, put my hands up her skirt, detached her artificial leg, and hit him over the head with it. <laughs> It was not my intention to do any more than frighten him off, but unhappily for all of us, he died. <laughs> well, he told us. Flannery O'Connor already wrote that story. <laughs> <laughs> Yet another one. Um, dwarfing all known records for matrimonial homicide, Mr. Peter Scott of South Sea made seven attempts to kill his wife without her once noticing that anything was wrong. In 1980, he took out an insurance policy on his good lady which would bring him 250,000 pounds in the event of her accidental death. Soon afterwards, he placed a lethal dose of mercury in her strawberry flan, but it all rolled out. Not wishing to waste this deadly substance, he next stuffed her mackerel with the entire contents of the bottle. This time she ate it, but with no side effects whatsoever. Warming to the task, he then took his better half on holiday to Yugoslavia. Recommending the panoramic views, he invited her to sit on the edge of a cliff. She declined to do so, prompted by what she later described as some sixth sense. <laughs> the same occurred only weeks later when he urged her to savor the view from Beachy Head. When his spouse was in bed with chickenpox, he started a fire outside her bedroom door, but some interfering busybody put it out. <laughs> Undeterred, he started another fire and burnt down the entire flat. The wife of his bosom escaped uninjured. Another time, he asked her to stand in the middle of the road so that he could drive toward her and check if his brakes were working. <laughs> <clears throat> At no time did Mrs. Scott feel that the magic had... 
At no time did Mrs. Scott feel that the magic had gone out of their marriage. <laughs> Since it appeared nothing short of a small nuclear bomb would have alerted this good woman to her husband's intentions, he eventually gave up and confessed everything to the police. <laughs> After the case, a detective said Mrs. Scott had been absolutely shattered when told of her husband's plot to kill her. She had not tweeted at all and was dumbstruck. I don't know where to go from that. <laughs> well, um, we thought that we have another uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so. We thought that perhaps the um, audience would have some questions to put to the, um, uh, to the panel. What strikes you out there that you want to know about the writing of, um, or the life of the humorist? Here we are. Yeah, yeah, we were just talking about Peter DeVries at lunch, how funny, funny writer he was. And uh, every time anybody asks me who I recommend, I always say Charles Portis, who was greatly underappreciated, funny novelist, comic novelist, who wrote a great novel called Norwood, another one called Masters of Atlantis. Anyway, I think we're all dogs uh, of the South. Dogs of the South. The dog of the South. The dog of the South. Yeah. Um, Anyway, yeah, well, I think we all tend to be sort of uh, collectors and lovers, special lovers of funny writing. I agree about uh, about Charles Portis. Um, I think I think I just read Norwood this summer. I I don't know why I hadn't read it. Some of these are now out in a kind of a paperback. Yeah, the reissue. Uh, yeah. um, and um, uh, the Southern writer who really, well, I think I think he's hilarious. Yeah, um, yeah I read I read. Uh, Some novels that are that are meant to be funny, uh, I, and I enjoy the the sort of. I think we happen to be at a time when, when uh, a lot of people write short, humorous pieces uh, pretty well, and and there are quite a few of them. By, by quite a few of them, I mean it, you know it's like eight or something. You know, so, I mean I don't I don't think it's ever anything that thousands of people do. Uh, Isn't one of the problems with humor though that humor though that it uh, dies rather quickly, more quickly than other forms, that it's uh, particularly if you deal, as you do, indeed, right. with uh, topical uh, subjects. And is that you mean like Huckleberry Finn? Is that something that you <laughs> think about when you write? I wonder if someone's going to understand what I'm talking about five years from now. Well, if you read, if you... If I can't imagine people will read five years from now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that optimistic. Also, if you're writing for a weekly magazine, I don't think you worry about five years from now. Right. Um, Although the New Yorker, I must say, you know, sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, they read them in doctors' offices. Uh, sometimes somebody said, "I just read this piece you read, wrote, very interesting." I said, oh, "What piece was that?" And they named something I wrote eight years ago or something. And I, I always say, "I hope it was a checkup and nothing serious." Right? <laughs> uh, uh, There's a great, yeah. great writer for the New Yorker from who grew, grew up in North Carolina named Joe Mitchell. There's a great. He died recently. There was a great uh, interview of him on NPR one time. I wish I could do his voice, but he was saying, they asked him something. He, he was talking about how he used to write for the New Yorker, and he said he got an award from uh, University of North Carolina or something, recognizing him as a master writer or something. And he said, I called up my daughter, and I said, uh, I won this award and, and all. And, uh, and she said, I see you're still fooling them. And he <laughs> said, and that just tickled me. He said, don't get me wrong. I, I love the... Love the honor and everything, but, but just fooling them. That's what really tickled me. He <laughs> said, I was just writing uh, something for a weekly magazine, hoping it was funny. Can you imagine what a mess I would have made if I tried to write literature? <laughs> 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 On the other hand, Joe Mitchell was, a, was uh, elected to the uh, American Academy of Arts and Letters <laughs> in yeah, 1970, I mean, yeah. the rare reporter, um, and was a real scholar of Joyce, but somehow, somehow, uh, he did come across and wanted to be sort of simple reporter, and and uh, he uh, one of the one of the theories of why he quit writing was that uh, he was writing along uh, at the same speed as everybody else, and then some English professor said he was the greatest master of the English declarative sentence in America, and that stopped him cold. Mm. Um, I don't think it's true. The, I think the key. I, I did an anthology of Southern humor. And I read a whole lot of sort of friendly, warm-hearted 
old humor, and it was awful. And the mean humor, the nasty, biting humor, tended to survive a lot longer than the, because the whole heartwarming sort of humor was so friendly, and it clearly was trying to make you laugh, whereas the mean stuff was just being mean, and it was so mean that it, and sharp and clever that it made you laugh. I think if you seem to be trying to make people laugh, it doesn't work. Well, Portis and uh, other people, uh, the great thing about all the Portis is when I talk to people about how to write funny stuff, students and stuff, I said, the only thing I can tell you is that if you're writing a funny novel, nobody in the novel should be trying to be funny. The more they're trying not to be funny, the funnier they can be. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> hey, definitely getting older. I think there's a lot of funny stuff on TV. Uh, you know that the uh, Larry Sanders show was wonderful. Was wonderful, I think. And, and cable TV, I think, has gotten better than the movies. Movies are get movie comedy is getting worse and worse on the whole, I think. And TV is, uh, in some ways, I mean, I think there's still funny stuff and uh, on. Television just it's, it tends to be dirtier, but uh, but it's still good. Uh, Steve Allen, the, uh, Steve Allen's obituary said that he would uh, call out for people to somebody to call out stuff in the audience for him to write a song, and somebody once said uh, Doctor Zhivago, and and he wrote a song called Zhivago, Zhivago, around it. <laughs> just improvising. <laughs> Jonathan Winters one time. This has nothing to do with what you asked, but Jonathan Winters I remember one time on the Carson show. He was just taking, improvising things, uh, little skit sketches from people in the audience. People would suggest things, and somebody said airplane, and somebody else said Indian, and somebody else said sissy, and all, Jonathan Winters just said, great silver bird. <laughs> <laughs> they also ask him to do some, some, a lot of things with a, with a just kind of a, look like a dowel or a stick one time, and, and w I remember one of them he did where he said, the chair recognizes the delegate from Burundi. <laughs> <laughs> I once did a, uh, a documentary on, on being a stand-up comic. It was an hour-long show way back in the old days when they had our primetime shows. And my coach was uh, Steve Allen. And I went to all these great uh, comics to learn how to be um, a comedian for a half hour on Caesar's, uh, on the stage of Caesar's Palace, and Jonathan Winters was one of them, and, and um, the, my routine was written for me by the team that did um, Laugh-In, that show, if you remember that. And I didn't think it was particularly um, funny. There were a lot of John Wayne jokes and so forth, and so uh, I went to, uh, an, uh, I went to the, um, uh, the two comedy writers for Laugh-In, and I said, uh, uh, I don't think you captured my style here. And one of them looked at me, and apparently it's an old Milton Barrel joke, but he said, uh, Plimpton, if we could capture your style, we'd put it in a cage and club it to death. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Steve <coughs> Allen kept trying to sound, make me sound less like Cordell Hull. <laughs> it didn't work. I went out there, it was interesting, I went out there and um, performed this terrible half hour at Caesar's Palace. Yeah, but my name was up there just for one night. And Jonathan Winters uh, suggested that my entrance, that I should uh, pull the curtain aside like this and say, hi. And I d resisted doing that, I must say. <laughs> huh? And it was in interesting, it was like, uh, uh, I had these jokes, and it, I, the metaphor that I found for it, that it was a little bit like uh, fishing at night. And you'd throw this uh, joke out there, and sometimes and the audience is, is a pitch darkness except for little votive candles here and there, but there are about, you know, maybe 700, 800 people out there. And sometimes the joke would work a little bit, and, we, and you'd feel a, a sense of uh, a, uh, the line would, would move with the fishing metaphor. And then sometimes you'd throw it out there, and nothing would happen, and uh, not a thing. And it was, uh, then you get what they call flop sweat, and you sit there and you throw out the next line in the hope that something catches. It was a perfectly awful experience. I think writing is probably... Uh, 
At least you don't have an audience that sit there and hoots at you as you try to throw the line out there. I've done a couple of pieces on stand-up comics. Once when there was a strike at the comedy store in Los Angeles, and once uh, with the, the improv, which was the first of the comedy clubs, I think, in, in New York. And um, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, I mean, stand-up comics, I have to say as a group, I think it is possible to generalize, are, are, are not the most um, uh, stable and, and mentally healthy, secure people. Um, <laughs> and, and, it, and depending on, on your life view, you could say maybe that was the way they were as, a children, as children, and that's why they became stand-up comics. Or being a stand-up comic makes you that way. Um, and one of the things that, that is sort of frustrating about being a stand-up comic is um, you, uh, comedy's not defensible. Uh, if, if the lady in the second row doesn't laugh, it's not funny to her. And you can't say, Madam, many people, some of them more intelligent and educated than you, have laughed at that joke. <laughs> um, I mean, it doesn't do you any good. They're, they're gone. <laughs> Um, so I think I think that's one of the things that turns them sort of weird, and the and then the other thing is that every stand-up comic I ever talked to in this story or other stories, they always say that some jokes work sometime and not other time. So that so that you might tell a joke on the first show in Las Vegas and and get a tremendous response, and tell it in the second show and get no response at all. And, and it's maddening. Um, and uh, I, the closest thing I ever did to stand-up com comedy was I did a show, and Roy did one too. Actually, Roy inspired me. I wasn't going to do it. And then I went to Roy's, and there was a program with Roy's picture on the cover. And I said, I'll do it. I've always wanted this, uh, having a program, Playbill. And um, I don't know if you had the same experience, Roy, but I found, and I'm, I didn't get so that I was saying things word for word the same every night, but, but it was a two-week run, and ab about the end of the second week, I was coming reasonably close to saying more or less the same thing. Um, I found when, when something made people laugh one night and then it didn't the next night that, that there was actually a reason for it. I, I, don't f I, I think that either I had stepped on the line, or or the timing was off, or somebody coughed, or they or, were or, stupid. They, or they were <laughs> stupid. They were particularly kind of stupid audience, right? Um, well, Jimmy Cagney, what you say? What you pray for is a red hat audience, uh, uh, an audience that will laugh at a red hat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, you named that genre, by the way, of the, our stand-up thing, which is a middle-aged guy in a sport coat talking. Uh, right. Uh, that's right. A middle-aged what? Middle-aged guy in a sport coat talking. Mm. That's that was what now we Now it's called the presidency. How do you lock in on those uh, neat phrases that Chris Sterling used? He used the phrase about a bull in the dark is not in my eye. Well, oh, that's an old Yiddish phrase. Uh, grandfather? My father said when... when well, no, what? not boys to drink about being funny. Oh, I see what you mean. That's that's uh, it's a it's a good question. The, the question is how, uh, as I interpret it, is why is something that seems sort of routine? How do you pick that out as being something that's funny? Uh, and that's true in reporting too, because you have a, a thousand uh, quotes, and, and and somehow something sounds funny. The 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 first example is my is that my father, when, uh, who was from, grew up in St. Joe, Missouri, and spoke very much like Harry Truman, um, his accent, uh, but also knew <coughs> Yiddish, because uh, he had come from Ukraine when he was like two years old, something like that. And uh, when, he, when my wife and I first told him we were looking for a house in Greenwich Village, he said, how much would a house cost? My father was, shocked and appalled by any price that was anything different from what a prudent man would have paid in 1941. I mean, he was just totally, <laughs> and, and we told him how much a house might cost in Village, which now seems laughable. Um, and his response was this phrase, which is something like, Fenster and mein Egen, 
and I and I asked somebody for a translation, and it actually means it's going dark behind my eyes, <laughs> um, which I don't know. That that's what he said, but it's just sound, th there's something funny about it. it's going dark behind my eyes, um, and um, the other quote is from my grandmother, who I I mentioned in this book about my father was my mother's mother, who was I guess an hysteric, uh, uh, really, um, and. I think was always held up without saying so in words by my father is the sort of person that we shouldn't be. Um, that is somebody who's still kind of carried around a kind of a shtetl mentality. And uh, my grandfather, her husband, was in the hospital for some minor hernia procedure. My mother was with my grandmother whose blood pressure was already stratospheric <coughs> because of this. And my father called and said that my sister, we were in high school then, had a stomach ache, and that the doctor suggested he bring her into the same hospital, possibly to get her appendix out. And my mother told my grandmother about this coincidence in medical procedures, and her response was, give me poison. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, this, is, this is not the person you want in the next foxhole, really. <laughs> uh, Tragedy anyway. one generation, comedy the next. That's right. <laughs> No, exactly right. Exactly right. Oh God, my mother was. All, that's, I was. My mother was always telling us kids to be sweet, and uh, when at those moments when you least wanted to be sweet, and uh, then I, you would hear her saying, when somebody would compliment her, you would hear her saying, "Oh, you're just being sweet," and I felt caught caught between those two uh, <laughs> imperatives. That, uh, if I was sweet, I was just being sweet, and if I wasn't sweet, I was being, I was br breaking my mother's heart. That's why I'm a humorist today. You weren't breaking her heart, you were tearing her heart out I and know, stomping I her. I know, I Politics, we do have a long-standing relationship. Do you think that politics, uh, that the humorist politics bears a <laughs> <laughs> they add to a cynicism which detracts from politics? Is that <laughs> what democracy. you said? Oh, democracy. Sorry, that's a word I haven't heard in so long. I, thought I didn't <laughs> recognize it. <laughs> I think um, it's almost impossible to be a satirist in this era. Could you have come up with George W. Bush? <laughs> now, Jonathan well, Swift right. would be it's stumped by this. You know. it's, it's, what, uh, it's what I used to call being blindsided by the truth. Um, and there, there I used to have a, a rule called the Harry Golden Rule. It was like the Golden Rule, except it was named after Harry Golden, um, <laughs> who some of you may know uh, used to publish a paper in Charlotte. Uh, and in the 50s... Um, the Carolina Israelite. The Carolina Israelite, exactly, and, and which got all over the country. And... And in the um, in the fifties, he pointed out that that people, white people in his part of the South, didn't seem to mind standing up with black people, because they stood in lines with them and that and stood in various places. He had a lot of examples, but they didn't like to sit down. Or oh, the Harry Golden vertical integration. So he had plan. the vertical integration <laughs> of the schools. That was his. <laughs> his, <laughs> his <laughs> he said there'd be no problem if they took the desks out. Took it, no, no keep the desks, take the chairs. Right, let or, them just stand up, like just in Florida. Stand up. And and um, and shortly after he did this, the um, the uh, federal court ordered a library in North Carolina desegregated, and the first thing they did was to take the chairs out. <laughs> um, so this was like during the Reagan administration when um, what was the name of uh, there was a. Um, Black Secretary of Transportation, I think. Was it Samuel Pierce? Was that his name? Something like yeah. that. Uh, what? Samuel Pierce. Yeah, housing and uh, HUD, whatever it is. And um, and Reagan was at a, uh, it was about 1990, I mean, 18, 1983 or 14, <laughs> eight, not 18, not that old. And, the, and uh, he was at a reception for big city mayors and his secretary of housing and urban development, Samuel Pierce, came up to say hello, and he said, 
hello, Mr. Mayor, how are things in your city? <laughs> um, well, my feeling of something like that, what does that leave me to say? <laughs> um, I mean, if the president is saying that, then all, all I could do was imagine what he said in reply, which, you know, which maybe just played along saying, um, you know, things, things are fine in my city, uh, uh, Mr. President. The uh, few potholes and the uh, president doesn't recognize his own cabinet secretaries, but, <laughs> you know, uh, other than that, or, or, um, or just pretend it was a, kind of a joke between them and saying, hello, count. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How's the countess? How are things in the castle? Um, so I think they do. It's hard to keep ahead of them. Um, there's, there's no question about that. Harry Golden also, found, back in the 50s, found a sign of gradual integration in a desegregation in a uh, hospital. And he saw on the wall three thermometers hanging with labels, and one said black and one said white. No, one said colored, the other one said white, and the other one said anal. <laughs> <laughs> a rectal, I guess is the term. But that's rectal, I think. But, point. <laughs> it's got a follow up somewhere. question on that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I addressed, <laughs> that sort of gives it away, but I, addressed, I, I once gave a speech to Clemson and there was an enormous crowd and I was really pleased and uh, uh, everybody, and then somebody came up after, I mean it was a big auditorium, a lot of people showed, there, showed up and, I, and somebody came up afterwards and I said, well, I was, uh, said they enjoyed it and I said thank you and I was really pleased at such a turnout and he said, yeah, I know everybody in swine management had to come. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you, you, do you have a swine management bar department here, by the way? <laughs> George, there's one way up there. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I, I think all of our children are, well, no, uh, George has little children now, so my, my children have found me so funny that they moved far away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have exactly the same experience. Mine had moved to California. Um, they couldn't find jobs in Alaska or Hawaii. So <laughs> California was as far as they could get. And uh, I tell you what, I find them funny. And... Um, um, also, my younger daughter was about the only person in the world for a long time who could just crack me up and, um, and took great pride in that. And, my, and, and they're still funny. There's a, there's a, um, there, there's a uh, element of, of uh, children that, that uh, has to do with what I call the tiny deflator uh, that always kind of says the truth and, and it's often funny. I, and they're still that way even though they're grown up. I, I had a heart operation a few years ago and I, and I was about to go out of the, get out of the hospital and both of my girls had come home and they were, we were all sitting in the hotel and, and the doctor was telling me uh, the sort of regimen he expected me to keep when I got home and how little time at the desk and how many naps a day and all of that. And I was trying to look brave and prudent at the same time. And, um, and he got all through and my older daughter, Abigail, said, uh, gee, I hate to say it, Daddy, but that sounds sort of like your regular schedule. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh. I used to have, I can't even imagine it now, but I, I think one of the most hellish things in the world is to be on an airplane with little children, but I remember Anyone's. Some, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never make eye contact with a child in a plane. <laughs> but I would fly with my little kid, when my kids were little, and one time, I just would just went with it one time, and we were drinking our 
coach or something through the uh, earphone thing, you know, and, and, and I started making them masks out of the barf bags, you know, and the stewardess saw me tearing a corner off the barf bag, which is just so they could put their fingers through it or something, you know, puppets, hand puppets, on the barf. and the stewardess gave me such a lecture for sabotaging the barf bag, you know. <laughs> Somebody's going to use that. We used to have fun when I was younger and more flexible. One more? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't hear that, George. Can I couldn't hear it either. Could, I heard grind. <laughs> the world, I heard. You know, I mean, I, I, I just hope it's needed so somebody will pay me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you wrote try to fill a need that you sense out there. You fill a need and that you feel you want to be funny. Want to write, uh, like to write and just pray God you can keep on being funny past the, I mean most people are not very funny past uh, our ages, so. Uh. Our? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Bud's and mine, George. Mark Twain, uh, of all those quotes that I was started off the proceedings with has something uh, to that point, he says, uh, the best way to cheer yourself up is to try to cheer somebody else up, which may be one of the pleasures of, uh, of writing uh, or trying to write humor. I, I make myself laugh while writing about once every two years. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually, usually with something that just sort of snuck onto the page, which I hadn't expected, and I'll laugh, and, and my wife says, what are you doing in there? I said, I love <laughs> laughing at it. So I figure if I ever were captured by terrorists and put in solitary confinement, uh, I would not be totally without resources. I would every year or two be able to give myself <laughs> a giggle. Um, We're very glad to hear that. <laughs> there was another one here somewhere. Where was it? There we are. Just tell me, I'll do it. <laughs> I thought he said he didn't get any cheap laughs. <laughs> that was an hour ago. Huh? <laughs> No, I, I think all, phil all, philosoph <laughs> all philosophical questions go to Fran, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not worth directing my <laughs> back, back in the, somehow, the 30s, I think, Max Eastman wrote a book called The Enjoyment of Laughter, in which he analyzed American humor. And somebody, I think Robert Benchley said, uh, Max Eastman has gotten American humor down and broken its arm. <laughs> You also said that all letters, that be, all sentences that begin with W. Was that a right. great secret? Yeah. That was a great secret. All sentences that begin with W were essentially funny. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Should we? Yes. That's what really makes something funny. What is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. There's no. It's the worst straight line in the world. How do you be funny? Well, I'm so glad we've told you how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Any one more? Any more questions? Otherwise, we'll call it a day and go out and try to amuse our fellow man. Somewhere.
Where? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to follow me home and see. Uh, uh, sure, I think that uh, Southerners are better than everybody at everything except abstract thought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that was for your answer or for all of us. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was against abstract thought. I, mean. I think it was abstract thought. Well, once again, we are so pleased that you came on this uh, summer yeah. afternoon, and uh, thank you so much once again. Thank you. <laughs>